Well, good morning, Santa Cruz Community Church. Uh, my name is Gilbert Foster, and I am the Director of Recruitment and Development for Growing Healthy Churches. And that's the region of churches that you are a part of, 140 churches here in Northern California. Pastor Dan, Pastor Dan reached out to me and at this time of loss for him to see if I could help fill the pulpit. And so just now, I am the interim senior pastor just up the road from you at another GHC church, uh, Crosswalk Community Church in Sunnyvale. And their pastor just retired at the end of 2020. And so I get the great honor to serve them for a few months in this transitional period. But on Wednesday morning of last week, I recorded a message for Crosswalk Community Church. And this morning, we're going to also share that message with you in Santa Cruz. So it's preach number four in a series in Mark's gospel. And I know you've missed the first three sermons, but I hope this message still informs and inspires you and brings you encouragement and challenge. And most of all, it reveals even more to us about the Christ that we follow and worship as our Savior and our Lord. So we pray for Pastor Dan at this time. Uh, we pray God's blessing upon him and we bring this message to you that was preached in Sunnyvale this morning, but through the wonders of media and digital uh, communication, we're able to share this message also with you. And on behalf of Growing Healthy Churches, we bring you our greetings as we begin to preach now on Mark's Gospel, chapter three. Okay, here's the message, are you ready? Since I reached the age of two and could understand English, I've never liked my name, Gilbert. There were no other Gilberts in my class in school. There was no other Gilberts in the church that I attended. Uh, does, does anyone watching or listening today have the name Gilbert? You know, why did my parents choose an odd, uncommon, unusual name, Gilbert? But, but, but the biggest reason I had for not liking my name was that I grew up with a stutter, just like our new president. And all the way through elementary school and high school, I struggled to pronounce my name. I would say something like this here, Gilbert. Very embarrassing as an eight-year-old or as a 13-year-old. I, I even re remember once in high school, uh, we had a sub-teacher come in for the day who didn't know our names. And so we were asked to introduce ourselves and I always sat at the back of the class. So I am sweating all the way through as the other 30 students introduced themselves. And eventually the teacher came to me and, and he said, what's your name? And I said, my name is G -G 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 David. <laughs> it was easier to pronounce. Well, the, the students all laughed. The teacher was not amused. And uh, back in the day, that, that, that this was a time when teachers could use a leather belt to punish you with, okay? And I got four lashes whew, across the palms of my hands. They stung. And now, after much work and uh, uh, going to speech therapy, I am able to introduce myself. Hi, my name is Reverend Foster. <laughs> Do you like your name? Uh, and just so you know, even worse than my own name and me trying to pronounce it is when people take the privilege to abbreviate my name and give me a nickname like Hi Gil. Oh, I tell you, I will never talk to you again if you call me Gil, okay? Uh, and I have three people who have been invited to call me Gibby. Uh, but I'm not planning on inviting anybody else. So the name is Gilbert. Now, as we continue our series in Mark's Gospel, part four, Mark takes his pen in chapter three and he tells us some names. So if you have a Bible, Mark's Gospel, chapter three, verses 13 to 19. It says these words, Jesus went up on a mountain and called to him those he wanted and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. And then verses 16 and 17 and 18 and 19, he lists those 12. 
So there's Simon, who's given the new name Peter. And then there's James and his brother, and his, 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 his brother's John. And the James and John are nicknamed Bonerges, Sons of Thunder. And that kind of makes you wonder why or how they got that nickname. And then there's Andrew, who is Simon Peter's brother. Uh, the second of possibly four, if not five, brothers in this short list. There's Philip, who's always bringing people to Jesus. There's Bartholomew, who we know absolutely nothing about, except that his father's name was Thalmia. Matthew, which means the gift of Yahweh. Thomas and Mark. Uh, remember, Mark has a nickname, Colobodilactylus, stump fingers. And, and Mark either doesn't know the nickname or Thomas or Thomas has bribed him not to share it, but his nickname is Didymus, which means the twin. And not that he has a twin brother, but legend says he got the nickname because of his resemblance to Jesus. Uh, and next on the list is Matthew's brother, third set of brothers, James, son of Alphaeus. And then two more nick nicknames. There's Thaddeus, which means big-hearted, and then there's Simon the Zealot. And that word zealot is based on the Hebrew word chana, to be zealous. Uh, and some people think he's just an, an, an encouraging, enthusiastic guy. Others think that the word chanas there, zealous, is, is part of the zealot movement, which was a revolutionary political movement. Uh, possibly, though, that zealot movement didn't really reach its pinnacle until AD 66, AD 60. And so, unsure if Mark had, Mark's gospel was written probably prior to that time. And then, last on the list, and is always last on the list, is Judas Iscariot. And uh, that word Iscariot comes from the word Iscari, which is the man of the sicker, the name of a special dagger. He is Judas the knife man. Name. Notice they are ordinary names, names that we might give our children or any Jewish family could give to their children. Six of them have nicknames or added names that clearly indicate this wasn't a list of people who held high honour or high status in society. You, you don't nickname a titled person, uh, not to their face anyway, okay? <laughs> but you, you certainly don't call the local mayor the son of thunder, you know? Uh, uh, thunder makes a loud noise and, and bodes trouble and it's the sort of thing you'd maybe see in the back of a Harley rider's jacket, okay? Or maybe not, because really Harley riders are just accountants dressing up tough on a Sunday afternoon, you know. Uh, uh, but these boys, the Sons of Thunder, were bad-tempered ones and, 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 you know, we wonder how they got their nick nickname. And notice how many sets of brothers. Nearly half of them are brothers. And that's interesting. It's worthy of some thinking about how God sometimes calls brothers or sisters or the connection between fathers and sons. Like, I'm the son of a preacher. Who was the son of a preacher? Will my sons be preachers? Is there a new line of Levi? And that's not genes, by the way, okay? That's the line of priests, okay? Uh, there's a lot to think about through this simple list of names. And because, remember, it's more than a list of names. It's 12 tangible, living, real, flesh and blood people. And, and notice the words in verse 14. Jesus appointed them that they might be with him. And this is a portrayal of the fully human Jesus. He seeks companionship, a support group, fellowship. He lives as a person, not as an isolated prophet, but he lives in community with others. And so he calls 12 to be with him, a ragtag bunch of misfits. And this is where I want to start this morning. I want you to meet the parents of the sons of thunder, Mr. and Mrs. Zebedee. Uh, and I was blessed to hear my old teaching pastor talk a little bit into this passage, and so I'm indebted to him for some of my insights that I share with you this, this, this morning. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Zebedee. They fished. 
Up in the North Country, where Mark's Gospel chapter 3 happens, Mr. Zebedee makes a living out of fishing the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Lake of Gennesaret. And it's the lowest freshwater lake in the world, and it's the biggest freshwater lake in Israel, 33 miles to go all the way around it. James and John helped out with their dad's business, mending nets, trawling their nets, in the early hours of the morning, selling the fish in the nearby major market town of either Sephorus or maybe Capernaum. Now, James and John, they hadn't grown up wanting to be fishermen in Galilee. They'd hoped to have left town. But that was just a dream. And a dream that needed them to really study hard, learn a lot, because the only way out of the town for these kids to the big city was if their parents were either mega rich or if they had been invited to study the Hebrew scriptures at the Jerusalem temple. But James and John, well, they knew every inlet and bay around Galilee, but memorizing the scriptures hadn't really been their thing. So they were stuck in little old Galilee. And this needs me to talk a little bit about education in Israel in the first century. There were three stages of formal education in Israel. And it all revolved around what's called the Torah. Uh, they didn't have textbooks on math or human anatomy or computer studies. Everything they needed to learn, they believed, was contained in the Torah the books of Moses that God had given Israel. The first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, we sometimes call them the Pentateuch. At school, that's what you would learn. Not social studies, not, you know, uh, 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 car mechanics or physical education. You studied the Torah. And this is what we know from Jewish sources from history. The first stage of education was called Bet Sefer, which means house of the book. And you would begin Bet Sefer round about the age of six years old. Bet Sefer was taught in a local synagogue, which was like a local school. And so your village, the village of Capernaum or Tyre or Sidon, you'd have a village synagogue and you'd have a local Torah teacher, a local rabbi. And so the kids at six would go during the day to the local synagogue where the rabbi would be their school teacher. Now, on the first day of school, they would sit and the rabbi would take honey and each child would have a piece of slate probably in front of them to help them write and, and learn the text. And the rabbi would take honey and he would cover the slate in the honey. It would be all over their fingers and all over their hands. Honey in the Jewish world was a symbol of God's favor, of his luxury. Honey was rare, the most pleasurable, enjoyable thing you could imagine. This was an incredible delicacy, honey. And the rabbi would cover, as a six-year-old, your slate with honey. You'd have it all over you. And then the rabbi would say these words, my child, my pupil, lick the honey. And as a six-year-old, you would lick the honey. And, and the rabbi would say, may you never forget that the words of God are like honey. The words of God are like the most enjoyable pleasurable thing. He would say, may you never forget that the words of God are most enjoyable, pleasurable thing you could ever have. Taste and see that God is good. May you be like Ezekiel, he would say. You tasted the scroll and it tasted sweet like honey. So as a small child, the scriptures would be linked in a very tactile taste sense with the most pleasurable, joyful thing you could possibly imagine. Is that how you feel 
about the text of scripture? <laughs> Am I preaching yet? Is that how you feel? For us to be followers of Jesus, I think we have to ask some very difficult questions about what we consider joyful and pleasurable. And as a six-year-old child, you would begin memorizing the Torah. Bet Sefer lasted from six years to ten years. And by ten years old, you had memorized the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And you hadn't just memorized the five names of the books. You'd memorized all the words in the books. And you say, well, well, that was different now. Really? Okay, show me two boys who don't know the words to every single scene in Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> you know? My younger son, uh, uh, he, can, he can travel like 25, 30 miles and sing every country song there is on the radio. Every one of them. And he's proud of it. Okay? We, we have just stressed learning and digesting different things. Would you agree? By 10, Bet Sefer, you had the Torah memorized. Now, the next phase would be from the ages of 10 to 14. And it's called Bet Talmud. And during ages 10 to 14, you would continue on if you were the best of the best. And in Bet Talmud, you would memorize the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. Genesis all the way to the Italian prophet Malachi. <laughs> now that's a joke, okay? All the way to the last Hebrew prophet, Malachi. By 13 or 14, you as a student had memorized the entire Hebrew scriptures, the entire Old Testament. And in that memorization, you would also learn the art of Jewish questions and answers. So, you see, we're Western and our education system is Western and therefore very rational. It's very oriented around the transmission of information. We tend to see education as the teacher gives us information, the student takes that information, and then at the appropriate time, called exams, we spit it back, hopefully in the same way that it was given to us. We would, we would teach a, teach a, teach a, teach a uh, child, what's two plus two? And the child would say four, and we would say, well done. In the Jewish culture, they see learning as far more interactive and there's far more processing going on. The rabbi might say, "Why? what do two trees plus another two trees equal? And the student might answer, why do some trees grow taller than other trees? They were teaching children not just how to spit back information, but how to process, how to, how to think, how to be sharp on their feet, how to take the discussion further. They would learn this art of questions. And that's why often when Jesus was asked a question, how does he respond? He responds with a question. He's not a politician. He's just acting like a good Jewish student. And the rabbi would teach children this question and answer. And Bet, Bet Talmud is roughly from the ages of 10 to 14. So, so Jesus' parents leave Jerusalem and they realize Jesus is not with us. And they come back to the temple area and they find Jesus at, 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 at what age? 12. And, and what's he doing? The teachers were amazed by his questions and answers. Why? Jesus would have been in Bet Talmud. Something very fascinating then happens at the age of, at, at, at the end of Bet Talmud. If you're the best of the best of the best, so you've made it through Bet Sefer, you've made it through Bet Talmud, there was a third stage of education called Bet Midrash. And Bet Midrash was generally around the ages of 14 onwards. And the best of the best of the best of the students would go through Bet Midrash to become rabbis. And the rabbis were the Harvard or the Stanford or the Yale students of that culture. And they would go to Jerusalem where the temple was and there they would study Bet Midrash. If you were the best of the best of the best, you would go to a rabbi. 
generally a rabbi with authority, a powerful rabbi. And uh, uh, by, 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 by the way, each rabbi had their own interpretation of the Torah. Uh, different rabbis believe different things about how you live out the text. Like take, for instance, the Sabbath. What's allowed on the Sabbath and what isn't allowed on the Sabbath? One rabbi might permit this and permit this, but forbid this. Another rabbi might say, well, I permit that, forbid this, but permit this. Okay, uh, and uh, the the rabbis uh, who would just permit most things, they would be called looser, and they would just permit lots of things. And, and, and to permit and to forbid was called to bind and to loose. So when Jesus says, whatever you bind or whatever you loose is rabbinical language. And the rabbi's interpretation of the text was called his yoke. When you follow the rabbi, you would place yourself under the yoke of that rabbi. <laughs> my, my rabbi came along and my rabbi said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, my yoke, says my rabbi, isn't about endless list of rules. My yoke is about freedom. C can I get an amen? See how radical this would have been? My yoke. Perhaps you know my rabbi. And here's what's sad for some people who claim to know my rabbi. They live a Christianity with a heavy yoke. That's not following my rabbi. So bet midrash. You were a good student, the best of the best, and you would then choose a rabbi, one that you admired. And here's what, here's what the student would do. You would go to that rabbi and you would say, Rabbi, I want to become your disciple, your Talmud, your student. I want to learn your yoke. And the rabbi would then begin to question you to see how well you knew the text. He would ask something like this here. In the book of Habakkuk, what are the 17 references to Deuteronomy? Give them to me backwards. Remember, everybody had memorized it. And the rabbi's fundamental driving question is, does this student have what it takes? Can this student be like me? And, and that's... That's a driving question. Does this student have what it takes to do what I do? And, and the rabbi is looking. Does he have it? Can he be like, like me? And if the rabbi decides this student can do it, he could actually be like me, the rabbi would say, Lech achare. Follow me. And at the ages of 15, 16, you would leave your family, you would leave your parents, and you would follow your rabbi. Now, swing back in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. Listen to these words. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Lech akari. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them Lech Achare. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat, and they followed him. <laughs> James and John, like Simon and Andrew, they drop their nets and they go, boom, and they leave fishing to follow Jesus. Why do they follow him immediately? Because they had grown up hoping that one day they might get out of town, but they, they, they'd hoped that one day they would make it to Jerusalem. And the only way they could ever make it to Jerusalem was if a rabbi called them. But they hadn't done too well on that account in synagogue school, and they'd stumbled their way through Bet Sefer, if they'd even finished Bet Sefer. Hence, they were fishing for a living with their dad. But along walks a rabbi. And he calls to them to follow him. 
when all other rabbis didn't invite you, you asked them and they put you through a ringer of a Torah examination. But this rabbi, this rabbi Jesus believes in me, believes I've got what it takes to be his disciple, his student, you would drop your nets immediately. And you and I can hear Mr. Zebedee shouting, you darn kicks, you're always running off around here, come back. But perhaps Zebedee came home that night. And as he walks into his house, he says, honey, 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 the boys aren't with me. I, I can see that, Zebedee. But honey, honey, the boys aren't with me. I, I know, I know, I can see that, darling. But I, 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 And they're not going to be with me. What? What do you mean? What do you mean? This rabbi came along who thinks our boys have what it takes. Can you imagine Zebedee the next day in the village at the diner? Oh yeah, oh yeah. As you can see, I don't have my boys with me today, right? Right? Why? Well, why? Well, 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 my boys are going to be studying with a powerful rabbi. A rabbi called you boys? Yeah. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have had your sons called? I mean, can you imagine his reputation in the community? And so there are 12 of them. The original disciples that Jesus commissioned. 12 of them. And a bell is maybe starting to ring in your head. 12, 12, 12. There's something in that number. 12, 12, 12. Oh yeah, the 12 days of Christmas. No, 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 no. 12, 12. Oh, dozen. The dirty dozen. No, 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 no. Oh, cheaper by the dozen. No, 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 no. 12, 12. The big 12 college conference. No, 12, 12. 12 commandments. No, no, no. There's only 10 of them, okay? 12, 12. The 12 tribes of Israel. Now 12 disciples, 12 apostles. Numerologists would say that 12 is the number of divine government. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 patriarchs of Israel, 12 apostles, 12 gates in Jerusalem, 12 angels in Revelation 21, 12 angels sitting on the 12 gates of the new Jerusalem, 12 foundations of that same city, 12, the number of divine governors. It's certainly the number of the tribes of Israel, the community of people that God called to himself. And now, and now, Israel is rejecting this Messiah. And in the appointing of 12 apostles, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, is starting a new Israel, a new community belonging to God. He is redefining Israel around himself and his followers. Don't miss what's happening in Mark's Gospel chapter 3 and the calling of Simon and Andrew and James and John. Don't miss it. There's a hint of this newness in some words that are used here. For instance, in chapter 3, verse 14, the word translated designated and the word translated appointed are best translated in the English language as made and naming. Jesus is making and Jesus is naming. And this is creatorial language. This is Genesis chapter 1 language. This is new creation language. And new creation language is a powerful language. It, it tends back to a section in chapter 2 of Mark's gospel, verses 21 and 22. No one sews a new piece of cloth onto an old garment, neither do we pour new wine into old wine sins. You see, you see, the Jewish teachers thought that when the Messiah would come, he would rebuild the temple that used to be there. He would restore Israel to the position that they used to have when, when David was king and he ruled and enemies fled and they had a reputation in the nations. They thought that the Messiah, the Christ, would come and do a better version of what they had known. But Jesus is not doing a better version of what was before. Jesus is doing a new thing a new creation, a new covenant, a new community. And this is so very exciting. This is, this, this is massive 
what Jesus is doing, the scale and the size of it, the radicalness of this, the impact of what Jesus is doing in appointing 12 is ground shaking, earth moving, destiny changing, world history defining. And to top it all, he calls the sons of thunder. He calls Peter with his rashness. He calls Matthew, who was a cheating tax collector. He calls Bartholomew, who we know nothing about. He calls a ragtag bunch of nobodies to start it all with. And in that brilliance, he turns societal tables upside down. He turns conventional theories on its head. He turns the status quo upside down and he loudly and boldly and controversially invites ordinary you and ordinary me. Stuttering Gilbert. Skinny armed and bald headed and equally ordinary you to be involved in a new creation that is better and greater than anything that's gone before. And he invites little old me and little old you to join in. He's designating and appointing. He's designating and appointing. He's still making and naming, making and naming. And he's making and naming ordinary people to build this new community, to be this new community, to live out this new covenant. So Crosswalk Church in Sunnyvale. And this morning our friends in Santa Cruz Community Church and in American River Community Church. We may not have the biggest church in town. And we may not, and and we may be filled with messy Christians pursuing a messy spirituality. And and we may be struggling with COVID and, and knowing that people are drifting away from our churches. And we may not have our act always together but in this local church in this church with a long history of mission and ministry amongst this group of believers the eternal God is naming and making and he's naming and making you into a new creation and he's naming Linda and Dave and Jonathan and Lily and Esther and Jerry and Dawn and Mike and Ida and Jeff and all so many more and he's naming you and making you as members of this new community and here's what's happening he is pinning his hopes he is pinning his salvation he is pinning his plan to save the world on this ragtag bunch of stuttering, stumbling, messy Christians. Absolutely amazing and thrilling and terrifying at the same time. May 2021 be a year when we live out this new creation and be this new community belonging to God in a greater way than ever before. Let's pray. It's hard to take it in God that you are making and naming ordinary us to form something new and great. But that's what you're doing. And your belief in the local church, (laughs) well, you died for her. You believe in us. And you want us to rise to be that new community, that new creation for the sake of your plan of salvation and to reaching to save the world. May that thrill us and excite us and motivate us and encourage us in ways that it's never done before. And may we begin to live that out in our communities of Sunnyvale, of Santa, Cl- of Santa Cruz, of Carmichael and Sacramento. Come, we pray, and take us ragtag bunch of messy Christians and do your amazing work within, and with, with, within us and through us. 
for Christ's sake and in his name. Amen.